Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the sixth meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I uh, welcome all members and our witnesses, and can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other electronic devices. We have apologies this morning from Gordon MacDonald, and I'd like to welcome Bruce Crawford joining us as a substitute. Uh, item one on the agenda, our members uh, content that we take items five and six in private. Great, that is agreed. Thank you. Item two on the agenda, uh, our members of the committee uh, content that uh, reviews of evidence heard and consideration of draft reports for our inquiry into internationalising Scottish business should be taken in private at future meetings. Are we agreed? Agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. Uh, item three on the agenda, are the committee uh, content that uh, responsibility is delegated to the convener for arranging for the SBCB to pay under Rule 12.4.3 any expenses of witnesses in the inquiry. Agreed. Is that agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Right, item four. We are now moving to uh, our uh, evidence session this morning on internationalising Scottish business. And I'd like to welcome joining us this morning Professor Jim Lubb, Professor of International Business and Innovation at the Enterprise Research Centre, and Gary Clark, Head of Policy and Research, Scottish Chambers of Commerce. Welcome to you both and thank you for coming along uh, this morning. Uh, we have um, about 90 minutes for this session, um, so um, hopefully that will allow us enough time to get through a, a range of, of topics. We've seen written submissions from you both, so I'm not going to ask you to, to make opening submissions, but we'll try and tease out in the uh, questioning uh, some of the uh, uh, topics that you both cover in the papers that you've, you've given us. And I would ask members if they would to be uh, short and to the point in their questions and responses that are short and to the point would be helpful. And while I think it would be useful if people could direct their questions at one or either uh, member of the panel, I think if you want to come in and respond to a question that's been directed to the other panel member, if you just catch my eye, I'll, I'll bring you in as time allows. <clears throat> I wonder if I could start off with yourself, Gary Clark, on behalf of Scottish Chambers of Commerce, and just pick up a, a couple of the points that are in your, your written submission. Um, you make the reference that uh, in, in relation to calculations made by SCC, the value of Scottish exports between 2006 and 2011 rose more slowly uh, than inflation. In other words, they declined in real terms. Now, of course, that was a period when we had uh, an economic downturn, and that might be partly responsible for that. But you go on to talk about how businesses in Scotland, you feel, are underperforming in terms of exporting. Why do you think that is? What, what is the major reason why you think Scottish businesses are not performing as well as, as they should be? I think that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, certainly looking at the evidence that we have uh, um, examined over the, the course of the past, uh, particularly past year or so, uh, looking at uh, international trade amongst predominantly SMEs, um, we're looking at the evidence that suggests that, for example, uh, within the UK, only about 5% of exporters of goods uh, are businesses based in, in Scotland. Um, so clearly that's below where we would expect uh, to be in terms of a, a UK standpoint. I think there's been uh, additional evidence this week. I mean, I've been looking at the, the report from N56 this week, which is a lot of good uh, evidence in there as well about um, uh, you know, really comparing Scotland's performance as a small region or nation uh, against other small European nations and regions. And uh, certainly it does not compare favourably because you would expect uh, small nations and regions to, to export uh, and internationalise more than Scotland is, is, is currently doing. Um, I think there are various reasons for that. I mean, clearly we sit within um, a, a fairly large um, free trade area within the United Kingdom and clearly the majority, around about two-thirds uh, of uh, goods and services uh, being uh, exported from Scotland are going to that, that UK market with the remainder uh, going to, to overseas markets, um, around about just under half of them going to the, the EU. Um, so certainly there are opportunities there, um, I think, internationally. Um, I think we do need to get culturally um, more uh, thinking more internationally. And I think that's one of the reasons why, in addition to direct support for businesses to internationalise, because we're finding that 
whilst not many businesses currently export, uh, there are a significant number of businesses who would like to export. Um, so how we um, provide support to those businesses to get them exporting is important, but also getting the culture right, and that goes right back to the education system. Um, the curriculum for Excellence has, has been positive in terms of uh, foreign languages um, uh, in the curriculum, and that brings forward uh, not just the language skills, but also the cultural awareness uh, of international uh, uh, countries around the world. Um, so that's certainly very important. We'd like to see more done uh, along those lines as well. So I think it's, it's very much a holistic package to get this right. We need to support businesses who want to export, but equally we need to get the culture right as well. Maybe I could bring Professor Lovin just on, on the same question. Um, What's your sense of how Scotland performs compared to other parts of the United Kingdom, other nations like Wales and Northern Ireland or other regions of England? You know, are, we, are we doing better or worse? It's difficult to tell, actually, exactly how Scotland compares with the other regions of the UK um, because it, it's difficult to get trade data on other regions of the UK. Um, by and large, Scotland is perceived as being relatively international in its scope, uh, it's usually perceived by the rest of the UK as being outward looking and international. But we don't have any particular de uh, details of the uh, evidence on that. There has been some work done looking at trade between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But the data there is so uncertain, it's difficult really to come to any clear decision on this. So it, it, it's really impossible to say for sure if Scotland's more or less export oriented. There is some evidence, though, that the proportion of firms and especially small and medium-sized enterprises that export in Scotland seems to be a bit lower than that in the UK as a whole. The reason for that isn't entirely clear, and it's a bit surprising uh, given Scotland's outward orientated past, but um, I don't know the reasons for it, but it does seem to be a persistent um, tendency. I mean, could it be simply distance from, from markets? I mean, presumably businesses in the south of England are, are closer to uh, continental Europe and therefore the, the, you know, there's an there's a accessibility issue that makes trade easier. That probably is part of it, given that Europe, uh, continental Europe, is such an important part of, the, uh, of exporting. But the other point is that we shouldn't necessarily think about internationalisation just of being about exporting. I mean, exporting is the key, one of the key ways by which small firms usually become international in scope. But there's other ways of becoming international through outsourcing, through being part of the global value chains of large multinational firms, for example. So there, there are other international dimensions here. And while Scotland's physical location might be an issue, in, if, you're, if you're transporting um, particularly weighty goods, for example, I doubt if that can really be the explanation why fewer firms in, in Scotland export than, say, in Wales or Northern Ireland. I don't believe that firms in Northern Ireland have any more of a problem there than firms in Scotland do. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll tease some more detail out on these issues as, as we go through the, the morning. I, I want to come back to Gary Clark, though, with, with a slightly different question. We took evidence last week from SCDI, who were talking about how they used to run trade missions um, uh, until 18 months ago, and, and now th they've ceased that program. The funding, the funding came to an end, and it's now and we now see trade missions run by by SDI. From the uh, perspective of your members, uh, what what's the view on that development? W was SCDI valued as a a trade mission organizer? Uh, has the fact that they've ceased doing that uh, being being seen as a positive or a negative move? I think what's important for a lot of businesses is to, to ensure that mix of public and private sector support uh, when uh, encouraging businesses uh, towards greater uh, degrees of exporting and internationalisation. Um, I think certainly speaking to a number of our members, um, they certainly feel that, that the SDI have a, a strong role to play, um, particularly in creating initial connections. Uh, but that business-to-business -business support is absolutely essential in towards developing longer-term uh, connections. And I think that's why um, trade missions run by, by SCDI or Chambers of Commerce, for that matter, um, are very much valued by business um, because it is about that private sector business-to-business -business support rather than the public sector are very good at making initial connections, uh, but maybe 
um, certainly we've had feedback uh, anecdotally that the structure of the trade missions isn't as useful sometimes um, because it isn't focused on, on business to business connection um, and also um, ensuring that, that the private sector have that understanding uh, that it isn't just about making a single connection, it's about sustaining connectivity over a long period of time. And I think that's where SCDI and the Chambers um, had a, a particular strength in terms of trade missions, which, which SDI have not so far, um, certainly anecdotally from uh, speaking to some of our members, been able to replicate. Are, are Chambers of Commerce, are you, are you actively running trade missions at the moment? Do you have, do you have a programme? Um, most of the trade missions undertaken by chambers are done by the, the local uh, chambers of commerce. So, for example, um, Aberdeen have, have a number of trade missions going to, to Africa this year. Um, uh, other chambers across the country, are, uh, Glasgow has always got good connections with um, the US, Germany. They've run trade missions there very recently. Um, uh, also, at the Scottish chambers level, we have done... Uh, some uh, trade missions last year went to Mongolia, this year we're going to Turkey. Typically, do these trade missions run by the Chambers get public sector support from SDI? No. No, so no. It's, it's purely... Well, not, no, certainly not the ones we've operated at a Scottish Chambers level. The, some of the local um, projects may get some support. I don't have the, the information on that. Um, but certainly the, the, the Chambers um, uh, trade missions that we've operated nationally have not received support from either SDI or UKTI. Okay. But are you using the SDI network? So when you're going to a particular country, are the SDI people on the ground there, are they involved in setting up a programme, setting up meetings? Uh, we would certainly try and use them where available, um, but we would also focus very strongly on the Chamber of Commerce in, in that country because Chambers of Commerce across the globe have got a very wide brand present in, in pretty much every... Uh, economy and um, certainly we would use that as our first port of call. Okay, thanks. I think Lewis McDonald, you've got a question yeah. on this as well. Just to follow that up a little bit and, and being uh, familiar with some of what, what happens around chamber led uh, trade missions, can you describe a little how, uh, what, what the geography of that is within Scotland? In other words, uh, you've mentioned Aberdeen and Glasgow as two particularly active. Chambers. Are there other chambers which have an international perspective in the same way, and, 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 and what, what does their focus tend to be on? Recently, so, I mean, uh, Edinburgh Chamber have been quiet for a number of years in terms of the international trade focus, but are coming uh, back onto the developing an international trade club, and they're looking at trade missions as, as a part of that, both inward and outward trade missions. And I think, as well as the outward trade missions, it is important to focus on, on inward trade missions as well. Um, because certainly, you know, we certainly feel uh, at the Scottish Chambers level that, uh, you know, often we get approached very late in the day um, to participate in, in inward trade missions, uh, largely organised um, through SDI, but sometimes um, SDI are bypassed and you end up dealing uh, very directly with, um, with the individual um, perhaps governmental agencies from the, the nations involved. Um, but certainly we think there is scope for that to be more structured. Um, across the, the, um, the Chamber of Commerce network, there is an increasing focus uh, on trade missions across many of our areas. So Inverness Chamber, for example, had a uh, trade mission across to, to Amsterdam um, to take advantage of the, the, the air links uh, between uh, the cities there um, uh, and very much replicated across the Chamber network to a greater or lesser degree. A number of us were recently with a trade mission organised by UKTI and SDI in Saudi Arabia, and um, one, of the, one of the things we heard about was an, a, an arrangement between the Asharkia Chamber, the Eastern Chamber in Saudi Arabia, and, and Aberdeen Chamber. Are, are there other chamber-to-chamber? -chamber? You talked about business-to-business -business connections being important. Are there chamber-to-chamber -chamber connections that operate on an on a inter international basis? And yeah, that are ab ab absolutely. I mean, uh, thinking about the, the ones which have taken place most recently, I mean, Aberdeen are very obvious example with the oil and gas industry, the international focus has always been very strong. So um, there's the, uh, the West Africa um, uh, um, business group, uh, which Aberdeen and uh, Grampian Chamber of Commerce facilitate, um, linking in with clearly uh, largely the, the sort of oil um, producing states in, in West Africa, Nigeria, right through to, to, to Angola, etc. Um, they're increasingly looking this year more at, at East Africa as well um, to take those areas on board and the potential that exists there. Um, also, 
uh, as you know, the, the sort of Eastern European uh, areas, um, North America, South America, um, being developed very strongly there. Um, Glasgow recently developed some very strong connections with um, the Chamber of Commerce across in Chicago. Um, Edinburgh Chamber have good connectivity with uh, some of the chambers in, in, in Germany and in Switzerland. So th there's, there's a wide variety of, of, of different things going on in the network. And I think one of our challenges as a, as a network is to ensure that we bring that together into a coherent offering, um, which, you know, taking aside very positive, um, excellent local services and ensuring that those are as widely available and as widely publicised as possible across Scotland. I think that's one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm keen to understand is, is how you respond as a network and, and how you identify gaps in the market, if you like, and, and, and therefore what, how government agencies involved, SDI and others, can help in identify and identify and address those gaps in the market. Do you have thoughts about that? Are there areas which chambers cannot reach or jobs that chambers cannot do that, that SDI needs to address? <laughs> I think there is absolutely a role for, for, for government in terms of uh, increasing um, internationalisation, in terms of reach across the globe. I mean, we would certainly think that uh, within our network in Scotland, um, you know, if you're looking at trading in any country in the world, there will probably be someone who has been there and done that. Um, so, you know, one of the things we're looking at is how we make sure that that um, knowledge and experience is, is transferred. So we've looked at, for example, the mentoring service that, that we offer, or the various mentoring services that we offer in order to uh, try and um, share some of that knowledge uh, more widely so that um, if anyone is looking at a particular market or maybe doesn't have a market in mind but has a product in mind and would like to, to attach a market to that, that there is someone they can go to with experience. Um, I think government has, has a role to play uh, in that, both directly in terms of uh, facilitating contacts overseas, um, in terms of supporting, whether financially or otherwise, um, uh, Scottish businesses um, getting out into the, the, the overseas markets, overseas businesses coming into the Scottish market. Um, government definitely has a role to play there, but I think it needs to be with a prominent uh, private sector role in there as well. I wonder, finally, if I can ask Jim Love, um, Jim, uh, if, if there are good examples from elsewhere in the UK of how government and private sector partners work together to promote export and trade? Uh, the, the, yes, there are. I mean, the, the, the principal route clearly is through uh, the work of the UKTI uh, throughout the UK. But the, the key thing here that I think is important, both at UK level and at Scottish level, is to understand that attempts to engage in internationalisation and exporting will work much more effectively if you appreciate the key difference between firms that export and don't is whether or not firms are innovative. There's a huge positive link between innovation and exporting that runs from innovation to exporting. At the UK level, this is an issue because hitherto export promotion and work on, and support for innovation have been carried out by separate agencies. UKTI for exporting and now Innovate UK, formerly a technology strategy board for innovation. It's now being recognised that those agencies have to work much more closely together. And one thing I think that the devolved administrations have a possibility to do is to integrate that kind of support much more actively in a way that hasn't been done at Westminster level because of this clear link between innovation and exporting. Okay. I've got a few members who want to come in. Um, Jack Brody, for some. Just basically following on that, there. Well, we're interested in what the UKTI uh, <coughs> and the Innovation uh, Fund uh, are doing at the UK level. Clearly, we're focused on what we can do here. I wonder if we can just expand upon the relationship between... I'm confused. Um, who does what? SDI, SCDI, SCC, not just in terms of promotion. Promotion is very important, but you know, the organisation, the products and the services. And looking at your survey, uh, Gary, um, I don't know how big the survey was, perhaps you can share that with us. 55% <clears throat> of respondents uh, do not currently export. And then we'll look at the influential factors uh, in terms of funding, finding customers, agents, distributors. Who's doing what? And how do you coordinate, coordinate your promotion plans with SDI and the CDI? And how do we uh, highlight the problems that are stopping pe uh, people exporting. And I take the point in terms of innovation, it's very important to have new products and services. And who's actually driving it? I, I, I mean, I, how much? 
many times do you get together to come up with some sort of cohesive strategy and who's doing what instead of overlapping? I think the plan is not, not to overlap. Um, I mean, no, nobody should be... In fact, it actually happens, doesn't it? Uh, well, it shouldn't happen. Um, you know, the, the, there shouldn't be any overlap in terms of provision of service. There should be, um, you know, as, as you say, a coherent service and replication is not something that, that uh, we should be doing. Um, I, I think chambers certainly have run um, trade missions um, when they have felt that what, for example, SCDI were offering is not uh, what their members would value and they were convinced that they could offer a, a far more productive service to their members and therefore that's, that's what they're doing. Um, and I think it, you know, at that stage, it should be the public sector who would step back and say, well, if the private sector are delivering something, um, uh, you know, let's see how we can help them to deliver it more effectively. Because um, there really shouldn't be any replication of the, you know, the public sector should step in well as a market failure. Can I just, just sort of interrupt? Maybe Jim can. Uh, we've heard this before about who's responsible for what. Uh, we had another uh, scenario with a pub well, in fact, were both public sector supported organisations about who's responsible for what. When did you last meet together with SCDI and SDI to agree you know, a strategy to avoid the overlapping in terms of how we push uh, and, and thrust Scottish exports? I don't think we've all met uh, three, the three organisations together. Certainly we've met with um, SDI and we continue to meet with them regularly in terms of their offering and, and how that can uh, best fit with the offering of, of, of chambers. Um, clearly we also meet with, with SCDI on a regular basis as well um, through the Group of Six and, and other um, mechanisms uh, both one-to-one -one and, and otherwise. Um, you know, at the end of the day um, what we want is the best possible service for business. I mean we're seeing um, for example south of the border uh, the government had taken the view that actually we should um, embrace uh, the worldwide brand that is Chambers of Commerce and actually look at accrediting more Chambers of Commerce overseas um, in order to provide that kind of long-term stable connectivity between the UK and other countries. Um, yeah, yeah, we've got Scots, you know, and now we're talking about more engagement with Chambers of Commerce and there's all one of the things, you know, maybe it's, it's frustration on my part, but, you know, I, I, I see three three horses, you know, running at this on this course, uh, you know, when there only needs really to be, you know, one shared uh, f focus. I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree that there has to be uh, a role for all of those organisations in terms of uh, the development of uh, Scottish businesses and the internationalisation of Scottish businesses because they all have connectivity that we need to exploit. It isn't just a monopoly of, of SDI. It isn't a monopoly of, of, of the private sector. It's about developing the right kind of balanced partnership between the public and private sectors to ensure that this takes place effectively. It's not happening. It's I, wonder not happening Jim, I wonder if Jim could make any comment. You highlighted an important part. Uh, all the surveys I've seen about uh, small businesses trying to break into the export markets, this is not uniquely a, uh, an issue in Scotland throughout the UK. One of the things they raise is we don't know who to ask, where to go to for support in the first instance. They're, they're, they're confused about it, they don't know where to start, they're worried about the risks and the costs involved and they desperately need advice here. Once they get into the right framework, and uh, this is either SDD, SDI in Scotland or UKTI in the UK, they do j often get good advice, but the trouble is that they don't know where to go. They're crying out for a one-stop shop and at the UK level this has been talked about for at least 20 years. It hasn't really happened yet. Right. Again, I'm more interested in what happens, what, what, what we can actually do up here and do it more effectively. Mm. But thank you for that. It just confirms what some of us who have been involved in business believe. Okay, thanks. Um, Bruce Crawford, do you have a supplementary on this? Uh, the whole concept of working together more effectively. <coughs> and it's like um, both Gary and the Professor Jim Love's views on how effectively SDI and UKTI work together in this area. I've certainly heard other evidence at other committees where this area could be strengthened and we could have a better approach and better cooperation. So it would be useful to get some of that stuff on record if we can. I think certainly our experience seems to be that the relationship is... It exists, but it's disjointed. 
um, uh, certainly STI um, will um, essentially provide a number of UKTI products within Scotland to businesses who are, who are looking for that. Um, they provide very important um, support in terms of direct support to individual businesses um, where those businesses fit with, with SCDI's um, criteria. Um, but there are also occasions where um, you know, sometimes you'll approach uh, SDI about something and be told, no, we don't have any funding for that. But then you go to UKTI and say, yeah, we have got funding for that. And you, you think, well, I walked in the one door, you know, there's SDI, there's UKTI services being provided there. Why don't I get a consistent answer? Why do I have to go to two places for that? So I think there's definitely um, scope for the relationship to be far more um, smooth and streamlined um, within within Scotland. Because certainly the UKTI brand is, is, is pretty much invisible, speaking to most of our members. Um, SDI is what they recognise as being the, the sort of governmental support for businesses. But, um, you know, UKTI do provide some, some very useful products as well, and some of those are provided through SDI. Some of them, you know, magically you have to know to approach UKTI <laughs> direct, and that's if you know they exist and operate within Scotland. From my experience uh, to, uh, with working with people at UKTI, they typically tend to regard... Um, uh, trade support has having, having been devolved, and, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, Regarded as something that's been devolved to the ministry, to the Scottish government through SDI. So effectively, although they are still responsible for the whole of the UK in terms of that area, as far as I understand it, they effectively are saying over to you, Scotland, and. Yeah, um, to, to, to a large extent, yes. I mean, UKTI are responsible ultimately for the government's trade support, but um, they, they, there's a, they've set aside a block grant for that activity, and they expect most of that to be done by, by SDI. Although, it, I did read their own submission. They do say they have a strong working relationship with SDI, and I'm sure that's true, but I don't know what that means practically on the ground. Gary, strong what that means. Any idea how we can make things better? Other than getting them here to talk to you? <laughs> Well, I, clearly they need to talk to each other more, I, and there needs to be a greater understanding. I mean, I remember giving evidence to a, a House of Lords committee, um, actually sitting in SDI's offices in, in, in Glasgow, um, uh, um, and you know they didn't seem to have much of a clue as to UKTI's role in Scotland, and those are some pretty senior uh, individuals in the House of Lords. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I, sh I should say we're going to get both um, UKTI and SDI uh, probably together uh, in front of the committee to give evidence so we can we can tease these issues out with them both. Uh, John Lamont, are you, are you following up the same issue? Or? I'm interested in how you get people to cooperate and whether there's a, an unintended consequence of devolution that we end up having a fight about who's responsible for what rather than it being something coherent. Um, I wonder if you want two things, comment on the relationship between not Scottish Government in Westminster, but the Scottish Government in Scotland office in relation to this, but it should facilitate and support business as opposed to getting a barrier to it. Um, and is there anything that needs to be done there? And secondly, I have to confess my every instinct is that state intervention is a good thing, but I wonder whether in this case, when you talk about business and innovation, where people are doing it themselves, we should be finding a way of facilitating it but and leave them to their own device. And I wonder in terms of the point you make about innovative companies will export the state can't do that, or are there things that can be done that would encourage companies, I mean, I think you reflect some of it earlier around education and so on, to be innovative and therefore more likely to export. A sceptical colleague of mine, not in here, but someone who I would have thought would have said, yes, of course there is a role for government, actually said, you know, if companies are good companies and you create good, strong companies, they themselves will find a way to export. So I wonder whether... Um, do you have a view on whether unintended barriers are put in place because of the nature of government in Scotland? And secondly, how do we facilitate and support without creating hindrance for people? Well, I, I think from, from our point of view, it's about... Oh, our surveys have shown that there's an awful lot of businesses out there who would like to be exporting. Um, uh, now, what is stopping them from doing that? I mean, the principle... Uh, driver that, that we're picking up is those a lot of those businesses think well I'd like to be exporting but I don't believe I've got the right product or service that uh, in, in order to export and I don't know where, where that product or service where there will be a demand for that so I think that 
what is important is getting to the right businesses at the right time um, in order to maximise the opportunity for that business to export. Now, that's why I think that private sector organisations like Chambers um, have a very important role to play because we're dealing face-to-face with business in 20-odd offices across Scotland, um, right the way across the country on a daily basis. So we're very connected to businesses of different scale, different um, sectors um, and, and, and different outlooks. Um, so that's a good place to connect. But clearly we don't connect with the broad spectrum of businesses out there. Equally, you've got the public sector, um, you know, largely through the likes of SE and, and, and SDI who are connecting with, with a number of businesses, but largely the businesses they are connecting with are those businesses which fit their criteria of sector and growth. Um, so those may be businesses which are um, uh, um, open to, 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 to exporting, um, but equally there'll be a lot of businesses that aren't touched by the public sector who will be touched by um, speaking to the local chambers, speaking to other businesses in the local area who could be encouraged um, and emboldened um, to take those steps. Now, I think innovation is, 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 you know, is that something we can teach businesses? You know, I don't know. I think there is, there's probably an element that you, you, you can take businesses a bit further down that, that, that line. Mentoring is one way of doing that, and that's a service we provide uh, right across Scotland. Um, but I think getting that right mix of the connectivity to the businesses where it matters and when it matters um, and having public sector support to allow our businesses to, to, to take that step. And it's about that partnership and how that works together. And I don't think it is working together as well as it could at the moment. In terms of, you know, back to the SDI, UKT, I think, and Scottish Government and Scotland Office, um, you, you know, businesses don't particularly care about, you know, what governments want to say to each other. They just want it to get it sorted. And, uh, you know, when you look at the, the great work that has been done, I mean, for example, Scotland Office did a great piece of work through the Wilson Report um, last year. Um, but, you know, due to probably the time it was published, you had to read through about two, three pages of, um, you know, why Scotland should remain in the UK before you actually got to the meat of what that report was about. Um, you know, and businesses don't have the time or the, the energy to do that. So it's about making a functional relationship work between the UK government, Scotland office, Scottish government, um, that works in the best interests of business and uses the best that those particular governmental agencies can offer um, in terms of developing um, Scotland's connectivity internationally. In terms of uh, my view on the matter, it comes from the, what the, the, the academic research tells us about the link between firms, productivity and growth, exporting and innovation, these things are clearly linked. So it is indeed the case that if you have lots of highly productive good firms, they will tend to naturally self-select into export markets. I don't believe for a minute though that means that there's no room for uh, government support here. The trick is to, can we identify firms which have all the characteristics of those that could do well in export markets but don't cur currently export? They're innovative, they have other good attributes. And find a way of targeting those and give them appropriate support, which often means lack of information about export markets. They don't understand how to do these things. They don't know how to get into exports. And that's where government support can be useful because it's a market failure. That's exactly why organisations like SDI and UKTI exist. Does that mean there's a problem potentially uh, through devolved administrations? Well, possibly in the sense that there can be a lack of links between support at the UK level and support at the devolved administration level, but it also gives a potential opportunity for joined up policy making, which maybe doesn't happen at UK, T, at UK level, like support jointly for firms which are innovative but not yet exporting. That's a bunch of market ready firms who aren't yet exporting but could do if they perhaps got some more information. So that, that's the kind of thing that could be done more easily perhaps in Scotland than at UK level to join up uh, uh, government support. So would you envisage government agencies not so much being available to give advice or support, but actually surveying business and saying, oh, you look like a candidate, and actively perhaps through the chamber or whomsoever identifying, go and speak to them, have you thought about? Because otherwise yes. there would be a hiatus. It's, it's exactly that, because... If you can identify the characteristics of firms 
which are more likely to become exporters. And we can now do that from the available data that we've got on surveys and identify the characteristics of firms which, for example, export occasionally but don't export uh, continuously. If you can identify those characteristics of firms that, that look like firms that are doing this but don't yet do it, they're, they're, they're target ready. Those are firms to which you can target support and say, yeah, we, we, can we help you here? Rather than a shotgun approach to all firms in Scotland, most of which will never export, nor should they do so. So it's a question of using limited resources in a targeted way. And we have, to some extent, the data now to, to, tar to identify characteristics of firms that can be supported effectively. Okay, and uh, this has ended up a very elongated thread, but um, uh, I, I, other members want to come in on different subjects, but one last supplementary from uh, Richard Lyle. Just, just a, a small question. You, you, you basically said that um, you know, there is a problem. Uh, in reply to, to Chick uh, Brody, you said the fact that, that you know, his, his analogy, the three horses running at the same time, I'm not a betting man, but would you agree that possibly we need a national exporting board? Or, or something like that, that, that uh, you know, one agency controlling everything or people that can feed into to discuss with other companies and, and get, you know, the Scottish brand is well known in the world. We all respected salmon, all the different other things, you know, from my own region, Tunnock's tea cakes, Tunnock's waivers, you know, logs, you know, uh, that's a plug for Tunnock's. Um, but basically, at the end of the day, you know, do we not need something to manage this whole and get everybody involved to promote the Scottish brand? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there does need to be um, a sort of coherent strategy in terms of exporting, and that strategy needs to encompass all the different areas. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I don't think that, you know, whether it's Chambers or, or SCDI or SDI or whoever, you know, competing against each other is, is not, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a horse race is not is not the most productive use of those horses. But pulling together, you know, well, like pulling a carriage or something like that, you know, is is you know, <laughs> you know that that is <laughs> that that is how it should work because all of those uh, agencies have a role to play. Um, and certainly in terms of the direct connectivity with businesses, I mean, certainly the private sector does have a role to play because if you're a business looking to export, you'd probably much rather speak to um, another business who's been there and done that uh, rather than speak to a civil servant who's been sent around to, to speak to you about exporting. So there's a role to play for, for all of those organisations and more. But, yeah, it has to be drawn under a coherent strategy. <laughs> We used to have a, an old word in, in, the, in the UK government, the Board of Trade, a number of years ago. I, sadly, I can remember that. Um, you know, do we not... Do, do we... A yet simple, quick yes or no, because I, I know they can get out the side of my eyes tell me to hurry up. A yes or no in a national exporting board or national exporting agency with the expertise to pull all this together? I think first and foremost we need a, a coherent strategy, and then you know the the, the, the structures that, that follow that are probably less important. But we need that coherent strategy that everyone is bought into, and then we can look at structures around that. Thank you, thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you. Okay, we need to move on. Um, bring in uh, Dennis Robertson. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, maybe if I start with yourself, Gary Clark, um, you you mentioned the Wilson review. <clears throat> And basically, you, uh, I sincerely hope you found the, 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 the time and the, the will to maybe go through that review um, after the first three pages. Have <laughs> um, you got any particular comments that you would like to make with reference to the Wilson Review? Um, I, I think the Wilson Review did highlight a number of the areas that we have already talked about. You know, for example, the relationship between the public sector and private sector when it comes to... Um, uh, uh, delivering uh, internationalisation support to businesses. Uh, also, um, the connectivity between the um, UKTI and SDI and the fact that that is, is, is a connection which in many ways seems to be broken or at least disjointed uh, at the moment. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think the Wilson Review does touch on a lot of those areas and it touches upon um, you know the need for coherent support for, for for business, and it is it's pointing to solutions, and we're not quite 
there yet. Um, so I think it's got a hugely important um, part to play in the discussion, and, and certainly from you know speaking to um, both 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 Scottish government and UK government ministers over the past uh, year or so um, since the publication of the report, um, all have um, spoken very highly of it, and I think it should inform uh, what we should be doing. Um, but um, uh, you know, is is it a solution in itself? I don't know if I'd go that far, but it certainly a, a, it, it talks about a lot of the right areas and it gives us the kind of guidance as to the, the areas we need to address. And I think those are areas that are common to the discussion this morning as well. You think that, that basically it, that in itself <clears throat> is there in giving you that platform for a dialogue? Um, I, th I think its value. Um, you know, I think it does have a very strong value in terms of. Um, particularly the relationship between between government. I mean, that is, you know, something that's come out of the Scotland office. Clearly, the Scotland office, uh, you know, want to be part of this agenda and want to be part of the solution. Um, uh, you know, I think it needs governments both north and south of the border to be working together. Um, you know, and there's a lot of positive stuff goes on between between the governments. Um, um, the Smith Commission, etc., has proposed uh, a lot more closer working uh, between Scottish government and UK government. So I, I think there's definitely potential solutions there in terms of how the governments work together. And I think Wilson is, is particularly strong in that regard. It's from the Wilson, and maybe move to yourself, uh, Professor Love. Um, one of the suggestions from the Wilson Review was the, the creation of this sort of single portal. Um, and, and you mentioned earlier... Um, I think it was an answer to uh, Bruce Crawford that, <clears throat> that there's a lot of agents, there's a lot of, uh, especially small businesses out there, they don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. They've got absolutely no idea. There's just a plethora of of information and agencies, etc. Do you think that the, this this the creation of a single portal for signposting would actually help, especially the small and medium sized uh, businesses? Uh, I think it might if it were done effectively. The difficulty has been that the, the idea of having a single portal to help SMEs in terms of both internationalising and, and innovation has been talked about at, at UK level and at Scottish level for many years. It has never quite materialised. Yeah, <laughs> yes. but, but only because I know of, I've, I've heard civil servants talking about it for at least 20 years. It's never quite materialised. And that's partly because of the diffuse nature of the knowledge uh, about these things in the chambers, the Federation for Small Business, so on and so on. Yes, the idea of having a, a portal in which they could get the basic information they need to find out where to go, I think would be very useful. But then you'd have to make them know that that single portal exists. Uh, and that, that, that seems to be, for some reason, terribly difficult. If it could be done, I think it would be very effective, yes. Agencies had in their uh, top line of any of their web pages go to. That'd be useful. <laughs> yes, it absolutely would. I think. Uh, Gary, do you, you got an opinion on this? Yeah, I mean, I think I think a single um, point of contact um, is 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 absolutely essential. I mean, you know, as we've already discussed, um, you know, there may be different places to go once you get past that point. Um, but uh, there needs to be many, many routes into that portal, and then that single portal needs to put you um, towards where you need to be. Um, so it's a case of many routes in and potentially many routes out, but, but that, that, that portal in the middle would certainly be of value. So if governments have been slow to move on this and bring this forward, do you think uh, the private sector maybe should look at it and create it and manage it? Um, Potentially, um, it's, it's something that the private sector um, could do. Um, I think, though, I, well, I, 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 think, I think though that um, uh, you know, given the, the the wide nature and the fact that you know it isn't all about the private sector and it isn't all about the public sector, um, that you know, hopefully there'll be some kind of partnership involved in that. Um, but certainly, you know, we would certainly be, be up for that discussion because we did not enable, um, and I think you've both mentioned this. Um, a few times now, actually, about mentoring. Now, surely, you know, if the chambers are providing mentoring, SDI are providing mentoring, SE are providing mentoring, um, would it not be better that if someone was looking for <coughs> some degree of mentoring that they could go to one specific area and find out the, the, the best area or, or um, agency to provide that, or even direct business to provide that mentoring? Because at the moment, it's a mess. Well, I, there's, a, there's a lot of mentoring around. I mean, certainly we would we would argue that our mentoring scheme is very strong, has delivered strong results, um, you know, for SE and for our other partners. 
uh, in mentoring, um, uh, and it certainly delivered strong results for, for the businesses concerned. Um, and I'm coming back to access in terms of where do you go, how do you know it exists, for especially the SME sector? Yeah, I mean, certainly the Chamber Network are promoted very strongly and it's a, a service we offer not just to Chamber members but to any business uh, in Scotland. Um, and there's various arms of that. that we, we run a programme in, in conjunction with, with Scottish Enterprise. Uh, we run a programme in conjunction with Highlands Islands Enterprise. We've already got collaboration in one area then, haven't we? Which uh, is mentoring. At, at, at the moment, yes. Um, so could, can that be extended into the other areas then? If we've already got this area of collaboration and partnership down mentoring, why can that not be then embraced to look at the broader aspect of perhaps this uh, uh, exporting what we're talking about today? We, we would certainly be up for, for those discussions. Um, and certainly in terms of providing support to get businesses trading internationally is something we're, we're already doing and having some success in. Um, if, if we can do that on a wider basis, uh, we'd certainly be open to, to those discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, John McAlpin. Thank you very much. Um, I actually wanted to ask you a bit about mentoring, your mentoring scheme. Obviously, when you speak to businesses that it works for, it works very well, and you refer to it a lot in your, your submission. How much is your partnership uh, with SE worth in terms of the mentoring scheme? Um, in terms of SE, I think the contribution from, from SE is somewhere in the region of about two hundred to £250,000 per year. And what's your input into it? Um, match funded from that is European funding um, and our input into it is providing um, mentors for the scheme. We've got over a thousand business people um, who uh, mentor other businesses uh, throughout Scotland. Okay, um, so what's the overall value of it? Well, <laughs> uh, we've done some analysis of that. Um, certainly, uh, I don't have the, all of the figures to hand, but I think um, certainly last year we engaged with um, over 800 um, businesses uh, throughout Scotland and provided one-to-one -one mentoring matches with those businesses. Um, I don't have figures for last year, but I think um, turnover... Um, or G uh, sorry, additional um, GVA from our interventions in 2013 was somewhere in the region of about 90 million pounds. No, sorry, 50 million pounds. Okay, and how how do you monitor the scheme because it's it's delivered by chambers of commerce that operate independently across the country. So how do you monitoring where it's working well and where it's not working well? We have a central. Um, Connections database um, to administer business mentoring through the, the Scottish Enterprise and Islands and Islands Enterprise schemes um, across Scotland. Um, we have um, targets for each of the, the individual chambers and partners participating in the scheme, um, and we ensure that those those chambers meet those targets consistently across the country. Yeah. The reason I ask is that during one of the roundtable uh, sessions that we had with businesses, there was a senior businessman that had said that he had come forward as a mentor. Um, and certainly looking at his CV, he had a lot to offer and the particular Chamber of Commerce didn't get back to him for a year. Why, would that be because they were making a match or is it just, is he fallen through the net, so to speak? I, I couldn't comment on individual circumstances, but obviously the process of matching a mentor to a business is something else that we do uh, um, as part of that, that, that service. Um, and it's... It's a, it's a very delicate balance getting the right mentor for the right business and making sure that the match is, is productive um, uh, in the longer term. I, I don't know the results of, I don't know the circumstance of that individual case, but if you want to send me the details of it, I could look into that and get back to you. Sure, okay. Um, what proportion of your mentors are, themselves have a lot of export experience? Because one of the most interesting you know, statistics that came out of, of this review was that so many of Scotland's exports are actually um, delivered by a very small proportion of small number of firms. So does that cause you a challenge in terms of your mentoring? Because there can't be that many people, you know, entrepreneurs, medium-sized businesses who are exporting according to our statics, statistics. Well, the mentoring services that we offer are not specifically targeted at, at, at exporting. Um, they can address exporting and we have a bank of mentors uh, with international experience who we can draw upon. Uh, in order to um, to match with any business who is who does have uh, international ex 
international expansion um, plans. But this is um, your mentoring scheme is probably your biggest collaboration with a government agency, is it, in terms of value? Um, I think at the moment, probably, yes. Yeah. So, but you say you don't actually have a specific aspect to that mentoring scheme, kind of ring fence, so to speak, for exports or encouraging exports? Not currently. It's, right. uh, it, the, the, the terms of the scheme are uh, we um, deliver that scheme um, uh, in collaboration with, with Scottish Enterprise, and clearly Scottish Enterprise have targets that they want to meet from that scheme as well as targets that we want to meet from that scheme. So there isn't within that scheme a specific target in terms of international... Just thinking in, in terms of, you know, if we want to grow exports and this mentoring scheme is the thing that you've referred to in, you know, several answers as kind of your great success story and it's obviously your biggest collaboration with government that perhaps if we do want to improve our export performance then we should look at things that are working and how we can improve them in terms of boosting exports. So ring fencing or a more specialised stream might be might be a way to go. We do have other mentoring schemes which are more specialised. That that Those schemes we operate with Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise are two of our mentoring schemes and very much um, focused on the objectives of, of, of SE and High. Um, we have other schemes that we operate with the British Banking Association um, in, in with, uh, within the sort of private sector mentoring. Um, we have other um, schemes with um, ICAS in terms of um, specific accountancy related mentoring um, and also with Sports Scotland which is very much obviously um, based at, uh, upon delivering uh, increased um, knowledge and experience among um, sports but exports, clubs. But not for exports? Not at the moment and no. if, if we'd be delighted to um, to offer that kind of uh, service across right. Scotland with the, with the right partner. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, I think, um, thanks. I think Chick Murray's got a follow-up on this. You pre a question I wanted to ask in terms of your mentoring in terms of export. Can I just extend that back into SE and High's uh, account management system? Do you have a view on the expertise, export expertise, that's available in the account management regime in the enterprise agencies? The feedback that we have from members uh, who um, are within the, the, the account managed scheme um, of SE um, and, 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 and High would, has, has been fairly positive, um, but it's a limited number of businesses clearly that that um, account managed system is, is engaging with. Um, but I think overall um, the, the feedback we've had has been, has been re reasonably positive in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the account management process. Limited. It, it's engaging with a limited number of our members, yes. Okay. Thank you. Back to Jim Love's point earlier about linking exports and innovation. Is that something that, in, in your experience, is, is delivered within the enterprise companies and uh, does it uh, impact on the ability of members who are account managed to take forward innovation into international markets? Well, again, you know. I, the account managed system seems to work reasonably well for those businesses who are within the system. But I think from our point of view, the problem is that there are a huge number of businesses with potential who are currently not within that system. Um, and, you know, particularly there are areas of the country, maybe the more rural areas, uh, largely, who often complain that they feel as if um, Scottish Enterprise, in the case of the Lowlands, um, isn't engaging very much within, within their region. And businesses feel a bit... Um, kind of left out because they they may not be in the account managed um, system, they may not be in the right sector, but they might be a very strong growing business. For example, SE doesn't engage with with retail businesses because they, that's not a key sector um, for them. But um, you know we engage very regularly with retail businesses, and clearly a lot of retail businesses have high exporting potential. Okay, thank you. Can I maybe pick up a couple of points we haven't really covered so far? We we, we Professor Love, we, we talked briefly about benchmarking Scotland against other parts of the UK earlier on. Um, in your research, did you find examples of successful export growth in other parts of the UK where they were doing things that, that we could perhaps uh, learn from? The, um, it's more a question of things you wouldn't want to learn from. I mean, I think well, it says, yeah, well, and, and the key one was really the one um, 
uh, I mentioned, I think I was talking to uh, Joanne Lamont, was really about the, 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 at the policy level, the fact that there hasn't been greatly joined up policy on the link between innovation and exporting. I know I've said this several times, but I think I'm going to say it again because it really, it really is so important. The evidence is so overwhelming about this that if you were devising a set of policy uh, options to support firms which were innovative in exporting, you wouldn't set up the system that currently exists, certainly at Westminster level, because different organisations handle different aspects of policy. Uh, if there's some way of avoiding that, I would, uh, that, that's the way I would go. I don't have specific examples from other parts of the, the UK because we were looking at the UK as a whole and comparing it with other European countries uh, and other parts of the world as opposed to looking at the different uh, regions of the UK. Okay, thanks. Um, and a question for Gary Clark on a, on a different subject. Um, you mentioned earlier the, the Smart Exporter Initiative. Now, originally I think that was delivered um, partly by SCC, but is now delivered entirely by um, Scottish Enterprise in-house. Has that been a helpful change? Has that made it better or made it worse? Um, I think in terms of, of um, Smart Exporter, I think there's, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and uh, it was something that we looked um, very closely at at the time we were involved in uh, for some time. But uh, it, it, um, it's positive and it was reaching potentially more businesses. Um, but I don't think it's been maybe 100% successful in terms of reaching the broad the scale of the businesses we need to. And I think perhaps more targeting um, along the lines um, uh, that uh, Professor Love has uh, mentioned already is, is maybe an area that would deliver more consistent results. Was it more successful when Scottish Chambers were a partner in it? Um, I, I think there were various reasons um, uh, around our um, involvement and disengagement from the scheme that um, were not directly related to the success or otherwise of the scheme. That's a very diplomatic response. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that intrigues me as to know what, what's, what's, what actually happened. No, it, the, it, essentially, it was a structural um, issue within the way we had set up an arm of the business to engage with, with, with Smart Exporter. Um, and that wasn't particularly sustainable from our point of view. So it wasn't a commentary on, the, uh, on, on Smart Exporter as, a, as an objective. And we did continue to... to, to uh, be involved in smart export or delivery in the Highlands and Islands area thereafter. All right, thank you. Um, Dennis Robson, yeah. yeah just, just on that point, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, um, is it evidence-based in terms of whether or not the smart export has been um, a success or not? I mean, do we actually have that as a, a measured, uh, something that was monitored, measured, and do we have that evidence base? I think I'd like to see more clear evidence of that. Um, well, I mean, certainly the anecdotal feedback has been um, certainly fairly positive. There was a, a, a good amount of goodwill, um, certainly initially in terms of the areas that uh, Smart Exporter was looking to engage in and the types of businesses that Smart Exporter was looking to engage with. Um, but uh, as with a number of um, uh, government schemes, I think it would be good to see um, a more regular update in terms of progress uh, against target. Yeah, so you're quite happy for us to try and seek that evidence and get a, a baseline. Yeah, on that. absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I think I think that's you know that that should be a standard across the board, no matter uh, no matter what. I think um, you know you know we've already mentioned our mentoring scheme. I mean that's something that we um, provide analysis and, and feedback on uh, certainly to, to 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 our partners in in Scottish Enterprise and Islands and Islands Enterprise every year. Um, there is a you know a measurable. Um, outcome and return for that um, and targets are either met or they're not and thankfully they always have been uh, and exceeded in most cases so um, I, I think any any scheme that the government is operating particularly where that scheme is targeted at a national objective um, I think we need to see the progress along the way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah. ask, uh, two very quick questions. One of Gary in terms of a Inward investment, of course, is, is, is a step to you know, turning around and exporting goods. I just wonder what involvement you've had with the, the BRIC countries. Uh, and if Jim could comment on uh, the, the situation with regard to Europe, the fact that we're not a member state and a lot of information does not flow directly to Scotland. In fact, we have evidence of 
uh, economic circumstances where we've not en enjoyed the benefits uh, that flow through uh, Westminster and, and we were dilatory in getting the information. Um, I wonder if you could address these international, first of all, the inward investment and then the, the in, lack of... In, in, in terms of inward investment, I mean, certainly we have met with a number of um, uh, usually delegations uh, coming into the country um, with sort of mixed results. And as I mentioned earlier, that I feel that certainly a lot of the engagement that comes uh, into the country and the interest that is shown in the country is not particularly well handled once it gets here. And we end up getting a phone call about, you know, two days before a meeting and, you know, could you pull some businesses together and, 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 and meet with this delegation? Yeah, we'll do that. But we could do it far more effectively and in a more structured way if... You know, we had a lot more advance warning of that if we saw our role and our particular part to play um, in that, uh, um, in those dealings with, with, with um, officials and businesses who are coming to our country. Um, and I think at the moment that's not handled particularly well um, from a central level. I think that is a role for government to coordinate and then engage with all of the organisations that they would need to engage with to ensure that um, th that delegation has the best possible spread of connectivity uh, across the country. I think in some cases it works very well. And I think in other cases it, it just doesn't work at all. So it needs to be far more consistent in terms of how we engage with businesses and, and, uh, and governments looking to, um, to find out more about our country and the opportunities that exist here. Yeah. Um, in terms of specific engagement with, with overseas um, nations, we've had um, a reasonable degree of engagement with um, uh, with China and with India, um, I think less so with Brazil. Um, and uh, I know that our chief executive, chief executive is due to meet with the um, Russian consul in coming weeks, but obviously it's a very specific situation there at the moment. In terms of inward investment, I mean, there's so much evidence that inward investment is hugely beneficial, uh, that in terms of technology, employment, all the spillover effects both at UK and Scottish level, yes. If there's anything that's prohibiting Scotland somehow being involved in that process or getting information it needs, that's hugely detrimental. But I couldn't comment on what those processes are. There's also a link there between inward investment and exporting, of course, because so many of the bigger, biggest exporters are themselves foreign-owned firms operating in Scotland. Okay, okay. Lewis MacDonald. I just wondered... In, we've talked quite a lot about structures and about programmes and so on. In addition to those things that, that, that we've discussed, are there any cultural inhibitors to engaging with exporting that we should be thinking about in preparing our report on, on our inquiry? Any wider concerns or considerations? I've, I've certainly mentioned very briefly some potential um, cultural uh, issues. I think there's... Um, so two strands of that. I think there's the, the cultural issue in terms of um, whether a business believes it has the right product or service to export and whether it's maybe assumption that it doesn't is, is an accurate assumption and whether there's, there's perhaps more thinking it could do there. And I think that comes back to the, the innovation point um, that Professor Love has, has already mentioned. Um, I think in terms of um, our international outlook, uh, you know, we certainly believe that that's something that ought to run um, very much more through the education system um, that encourages people to to think more internationally. Um, and whether that's languages in primary schools, as the, the Curriculum for Excellence is, is seeking to do, um, which we very much welcome, um, through to, um, in, in terms of certainly secondary education, but perhaps before that, looking at how we introduce businesses more into the uh, the curriculum. And again, the Wood Commission has, has got a lot to say there that we agree with. Um, uh, through to universities where you know, we're very much keen to ensure, I suppose, two things. Number one, that as many uh, students at Scottish universities have the opportunity to go abroad and, and, and partake in, in international experience as part of their degree course, we would like to see that pretty much compulsory where that's possible. Um, and we'd also like to see a far more um, open doors policy from the UK government in terms of um, foreign students coming into um, our universities and particularly in terms of post-study visa issues, um, allowing those students to remain um, in country um, for a period of time after they complete their studies in order that they can become 
far more engaged in the um, working in Scotland, developing connections in Scotland, so that they could either, you know, hopefully, hopefully stay here, but if not, then go back into the world with a knowledge and connectivity um, to take with them that involves Scotland. So I think there's all sorts of cultural areas behind there, largely in the education system. I think that's where it would manifest itself um, that I think need to be worked through more fully. And of course, as Professor Love has mentioned, very attracted by the, you know, the idea that um, you know, we need to get businesses thinking more innovatively. Uh, uh, that's very helpful. I, I, I'll put the same question to Jim up, but in particular, um, I wonder about the capacity of digit when you talk about innovation. Is there a correlation between businesses which are digitally, uh, which are trading online at home, if you like, um, and thinking online at home, and those which are up for export abroad? Is that a cultural issue as well that can be addressed? I can uh, say uh, that there is a, a very direct connection between that um, because the, we've done some work using survey data, which, which is exactly on that issue. It certainly is the case that firms which have a clear online presence in their activities are much more likely to export than firms that don't. But the question is which one comes first. It may well be that firms who, who wanted to export did that in the first place. But... It's also the case that firms that are clearly uh, have a, a very clear online presence are much more likely to get orders coming from abroad for that reason. So they may find themselves if, if like, almost becoming incidental or accidental exporters uh, because they got their order coming in from it, and suddenly they find themselves being an exporter. Um, but firms that are, have a clear strategy, or online strategy, are much more likely to be persistent exporters than firms that don't. If I can make a comment on your previous point about the cultural thing. For years, uh, I've seen evidence uh, on attitudes towards enterprise and entrepreneurship in Scotland that seems to suggest that we are uh, people of all ages are slightly less well inclined towards entrepreneurship enterprise in this country than other parts of the UK and Europe, which I'm constantly surprised at. I've never really quite understood why. I also remember in the 15 years that I worked at Strathclyde University, it's a long, long time ago, we had huge numbers of foreign students coming into the, the university, could scarcely accommodate them, had tremendous problems in trying to encourage our students to go out to spend a year abroad. That may have changed. I left Scotland a long time ago, but uh, it was a constant source of irritation that we could never get our students to go out to other countries, even for six months or a year, when we had streams of European kids coming to our universities. To ask a follow-up on, on, on the point Gary Clark made about, about foreign languages in schools, there's a constant source of frustration to me that in my children's primary school the only language available is French. Nobody in the world speaks French. It's not, it's not well, apart from the French, French. obviously, but in terms, of, in terms of international trade, French is a very minor language. I mean, we should surely be teaching Spanish or Arabic or Mandarin or even German a far wider international reach than French does. Uh, 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 well, um, <laughs> I think Spanish is, is becoming, if not the norm, certainly far more, more common uh, these days. Uh, and it, it is on offer at, at, at you know, a far wider range of um, schools and obviously into primary school as well now. But, yeah, I mean... I, I think there's, there's two areas there. I mean, I think it is useful to develop a knowledge of a language that will be of use in business. And, uh, you know, yeah, if, if you're going to be doing business in France or um, a number of French islands across the world, then, you know, you, you, you will find <laughs> French. <laughs> you, will, you will find French useful. But, uh, you know, clearly, you know, Spanish, um, Portuguese, uh, Russian, Mandarin, you know, etc. You know, are going to be far more directly useful. So I think there is a, certainly a case to say that uh, you know it would be useful to to, to focus on those languages. Um, that said, I do think that there is nonetheless, whatever language it is uh, that is spoken, I think going alongside learning any foreign language is that developing understanding of um, cultures which are different to our own, um, and I think that is possibly as important. Um, as the language skills themselves, particularly in developing business relations across the world, because you know when you're, um, I mean, you know, we've met with, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a number of Chinese delegations, and 
um, you know, knowing where to sit in the room and, and knowing what to have on the table and knowing, you know, to hand your business card over with both hands and all the rest of it, it is, is culturally, you know, as useful to know um, as, as language, as, as the language skills themselves. So I think there's, there's wider areas there in terms of, rather than just the, the, the particular language it happens to be. Thank you. Patrick Harvey. Convener, I'm tempted to suggest we invite the French consulate to a future evidence session before we finish the inquiry. Um, I'm glad that the, the last answer talked uh, a little bit about the cultural aspects of other countries because the, the question elicited some comments about our own culture and attitudes to uh, entrepreneurship, for example. But this, this cultural uh, issue is obviously obvious, uh, about the, the, the other side of the, the equation, the other side of that relationship. Some of our earlier sessions have touched on the ethical context uh, of internationalising business and uh, the issues that may arise around, for example, countries with a very poor record on equalities and human rights. Uh, what are the uh, issues that would arise, for example, for women running businesses trying to engage with certain countries? What are the uh, issues uh, in relation to countries uh, which have problems with racism or indeed with uh, corruption and bribery, uh, or with poor human rights and, and labour standards in the supply chain. I wonder if you could um, comment on the issues that are thrown up uh, which businesses in Scotland may encounter, uh, whether as, as barriers or whether there, there are ways of, of engaging with those issues in a, in a constructive way uh, as, uh, as part of the, the development of an international uh, relationship between businesses here and overseas. I, mean, I, th I think that's the hugely interesting question, um, and I think it opens up a whole series of possibilities in terms of um, how businesses look at, at, at what they're doing internationally and the role that they have to play uh, in that. And clearly, I think that uh, you know, in many cases, there is a role for business. Um, uh, well, first of all, there is a responsibility, I think, upon business to understand um, the the situations that you've just described and how they might exist an impact upon doing business in another country, um, what the ethical uh, concerns may be uh, in terms of a Scottish business doing business in that country. And I suppose on the flip side of that, how a Scottish business doing business in that country um, could um, perhaps assist to develop the situation positively within that country. And I think that's going to be very difficult for an individual small business to, to, to do. But I think there are wider questions internationally. I think that is an area certainly where, you know, we do look for uh, guidance, I think, from uh, governments, um, uh, certainly within Scotland and the UK. Um, Your organisations have engaged with this set of issues? Um, I'm probably struggling to think of any direct connectivity we've had in that regard recently. I did mention an upcoming um, meeting that our chief executive is having with the, the Consul General of Russia, um, and clearly there'll be a lot of um, issues, I think, within that meeting, both in terms of um, uh, sp the specifics and generality, to put it that way, of um, uh, the way that the Russian Thanks, yeah. government currently uh, conducts its business. In terms of the, the Enterprise Research Centre, uh, wh whose purpose is to engage in academic research and policy development research into the growth of SMEs in the UK, uh, we do have a strand of activity which is looking at the role of uh, women directors in business and black and eth other ethnically owned businesses in the UK. We haven't addressed the issue of the ethics of exporting or internationalising, but uh, I agree it's an terribly important issue. The key thing, I guess, is the extent to which any individual small and medium-sized enterprise suddenly finding itself with an order from abroad would know what, what, what are the ethics of engaging in this. And it's, I think that's a really interesting one, that they need help for that kind of thing. Uh, and the one-stop shop we've been talking, talking about would, I think, be one way of perhaps handling that. It's unlikely any individual small firm would instantly know what all the ethical issues are of a particular country or not necessarily know what all of the ethical issues are, but individuals, consumers, make choices uh, and, and many choose to be informed about uh, fair trade issues around labour standards or environmental performance when they make their choice about how they're going to spend their money. It seems reasonable that uh, even a relatively small business might have some consideration of these issues. 
I think that's absolutely right, but they, should, they also need to know where to go to get information about that as well. That's a key thing, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Just on the, the last question, there's a great book called Mind Your Manners, which explains cultural differences. Uh, it's worth the read. <coughs> Everyone's exporting to a whole range of countries. The second thing is I've just been privileged to be involved with a Chinese business people from Dandong province who have opened up an international business language school. Uh, they bought Glazenock House near New Cumnock. Anyway, my question is, is uh, on air passenger duty, uh, can you assess the impact that air passenger duty uh, has had on Scottish exports uh, and what you would like to see happen to it? Well, there's certainly been a number of um, studies done. I mean, there are in particular, two studies by York Aviation, um, which I think took place in 2011 and 2012, I think from memory, um, which detailed the um, damage, essentially, to, to the Scottish economy uh, that was being done through the imposition of one of the highest aviation taxes in the world uh, upon uh, Scotland and, indeed, the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, and I think there's a report from um, PricewaterhouseCoopers that, that came out last year um, which uh, went into further detail on that on a UK basis. I mean, from my point of view, it is pure and simply a, a, a tax on connectivity, a tax on, on internationalisation and a tax on exporting. Um, the sooner it's devolved and abolished, the better. Jim, have you any view? Uh, I've got no particular views on that issue, no. Okay. Thank you. Dennis? Uh, uh, Perhaps a quick question here. Um, with, with, with reference to sort of connectivity throughout Scotland at the moment in terms of road rail, you know, we, we've sort of just touched on air there. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you've got a particular view as to whether or not uh, this is in itself a barrier um, to some uh, companies uh, actually exporting because of the, the difficulty of actually getting goods to the appropriate, uh, where it would be port air, or real links, Gary? I, I think it can be. Um, it's already been mentioned in terms of Scotland's geography. Uh, and of course, in terms of, of air links, we um, are certainly seeing a far wider range of, of direct um, air services than we had a few years ago. Um, but still... To go down to, to London yeah, rather than... Um, I, think, I think most of our exports... Scots particu export. Yeah, particularly yeah. goods are either um, uh, you know stuck onto containers and either... Um, you know, stuck onto the backs of lorries or, 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 or stuck onto a boat. Um, but increasingly we are looking at um, uh, the aviation sector for exporting. I was at um, the conference of um, uh, our colleagues at the British Chambers of Commerce uh, a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about, or to be more specific, the, the chief executive of Heathrow, who had a very particular pitch to make, was, uh, was, 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 was talking about the, 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 the delights of exporting longustines from Inverness to China. And uh, um, pretty much the only way that that could be done um, in a way that was, well, <laughs> was, was by air, certainly. <laughs> he had a very specific solution to, to, yeah. to, to that particular problem, as you might expect. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that, that is one example of one of our major industries. I mean, food and drink makes up 18% of our um, export trade. Um, uh, an example of how we need to think far more dynamically in terms of how we get goods to market um, and in a condition that is um, acceptable um, uh, to um, the, the, the seller, the consumer, um, and indeed in the case of the longestines to the product themselves. Um, Encouraging you know, sort of some of the small and sort of the medium size uh, uh, firms to share like container, um, containers for, for instance for shipping because obviously it's a huge expense, and sometimes it may be the product itself. There's no way they could fill a container. Do you? I, I'm not aware of. An, I'm not aware of anything specifically within the chamber on that. I know that um, uh, certainly within the, the food and drink industry, there are some examples of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, as yeah, very good point. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of good product comes out of comes out of Aaron, whether that's um, soap or uh, beer or whiskey or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting it, uh, getting those products across Scotland, the UK, and the world um, certainly relies upon. So, is it something the chambers would solution. look at in terms of assisting? We'd certainly of, be yeah. be happy to look at it. I'm not aware of us being involved in anything specifically at the moment okay. on that in Scotland. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Bruce Crawford. We've been talking about barriers, challenges, um, areas where things can be done better. Could just flip that round the other way. Um, what are we doing well? What is our unique selling point? And how can we make that even better? Well, we've already mentioned food and drink. Um, you know, 18% of our exports, uh, we've got iconic brands, um, uh, not just in terms of the Scottish brand, but in terms of the, the individual brand identities within that, whether that's in the whiskey industry, salmon, um, you know, shortbread. Um, you know, uh, there's examples of that right the way across Scotland. I think we do that exceptionally well. I think we perhaps do need to develop further in terms of that national brand and what that brand means. And again, going back to N56, um, that was clearly one of the highlights of that report in terms of how we um, successfully build even further on Scotland's brand. That's something we would certainly agree with within within Chambers, and we've been talking about that for, for a long time. Um, so there are huge opportunities there. I mean, just while we're on the subject, then going back to a point that, that, that Professor Love mentioned earlier about um, those businesses who export by accident. You know, in in our survey that that we did last year, we certainly found that um, around about twenty five percent of businesses are businesses who will specifically design a product or service for the international market, and about seventy five percent of businesses are those who are just responding to, you know, demand and become exporters by accident. I think within a defined brand that sees Scotland as an outward looking. Um, exporting, trading nation, um, entrepreneurial, um, supportive of businesses large and small across all sectors. I think getting that buy-in will help to create that mindset uh, that helps deliver the sort of innovative thinking that we need if we're going to get that 75% who export by accident up to 75% who export as a deliberate business strategy. Thank you. Um, from my point of view, speaking as someone who A, used to live in Uddingston and B, did his PhD in Scotch whisky, I'm not going to disagree with food and drink being terribly important. But the other angle I think we sometimes miss is the importance of this knowledge economy from in Scotland's point of view and indeed Scottish universities, which I think we, we sometimes forget are such important gl uh, global players. Uh, our universities punch massively above their weight internationally and we sometimes forget, I think, how important they are in uh, essentially exporting knowledge, Scottish-based knowledge, through the huge number of foreign students who come to uh, Scotland, study here, and then go back to their own countries, and through the, the research that Scottish universities do, which is hugely influential worldwide. And I think we sometimes forget just how important the universities are to us. makes you wonder, if these are our two strengths, food and drinking universities, do they actually have a synergy in working together? Do, given that they are the, the big things we do and we're very good at it, you know, it would be probably quite a useful thing if we could get them closer together to, to feed off each other and drive from that base. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I'm sure, uh, but I, there certainly are links, uh, but what they are, and if, if they could be made better, uh, I'm sure that that's a good idea. I, I can't believe the universities in Scotland wouldn't be keen on doing that. Uh, they are, to my sure and certain knowledge, a pretty entrepreneurial bunch. OK, thank you very much. Sure. Helpful. OK, I think that... Uh, Probably about covers our session. So can I, on behalf of the committee, thank uh, Professor Love and Gary Clark for coming along. It's been very uh, useful to the committee and we'll be bearing all this in mind when we come to write our report. Uh, at this point, we go into private session and we'll have a short suspension.